Okay, so um, right now I have everybody on uh, mute and you cannot unmute yourselves. And I do not have uh, other staff support here tonight. So um, the best way to ask questions is um, to put those questions in chat and we will address questions at the end. And I'm sorry, this is not more interactive. We have just found, in fact, I was on two webinars today where we were participants and uh, the webinars were set up with everybody on unmute and people forget they're not muted. And then all of a sudden the phone rings or somebody walks into the room and there's this third conversation going on that's very loud. Um, and then you can't hear the speaker and it's very distracting. And so that's why we, we just leave people on mute. We will open it up at the end and allow you to unmute yourself to ask uh, verbal questions, or you can put questions in the chat. So I'm um, not sure why this bar is right in the middle right now, but um, we're going to get started with our slide deck and our class. So normally, Bike New York, between the months of April and November, offers, you know, roughly a dozen learn to ride classes or more each week. And um, many of those classes for adults, but most of them are use our bikes, uh, our instructors, and they have 20 to 25 people per class. And due to the pandemic, we are just not doing that. Um, I'll talk more about our learn to ride classes because we are opening up a little bit on a very limited basis in the next couple months. So this class is about teaching yourself or somebody else how to ride a bike. And uh, if you are an adult, you might need some support for this. So uh, Bike New York is a local New York City-based nonprofit organization. And our mission is to promote uh, more people riding bikes more of the time. Uh, we think that less car traffic, less pollution, less car noise, better use of space um, that comes from more biking is a good thing for New York City. It makes our quality of life better. As I'm sitting here in my apartment outside the Major Deacon, there's tremendous amounts of noise from vehicle traffic, tremendous amounts of air pollution. Um, so we we promote cycling through our events, our membership program, and our education program, which over the past three years has reached between 24,000 and 30,000 people per year with classes and uh, education programs. That represents a minimum of one hour per contact per person, not just handing them a safety brochure or a booklet, but actual, you know, actual classes. Um, so that makes us the largest, uh, and I'm gonna say the most effective bike education program in the United States. Um, of course, our major fundraising events this year, which always happen in the first weekend of May, were canceled due to the coronavirus because they do involve large groups of people very large groups of people. And so uh, we would appreciate any donations through our website. There is a donate button. Or if you decide to sign up and become a member. So Learn to Ride is something we started as a class for kids back in 2005. And um, we use a method that I learned when I was working in a bike shop in Queens, in Rego Park, Queens where the manager would just kind of like not sell training wheels to parents who would come in and ask for, ask to buy them. And he would say, no, no, do this. And this kind of stuck in my head uh, until I became bike education manager, uh, director for Bike New York. And people started asking me for uh, learning how to ride a bike for the first time. And there was, in my survey, 
programs around the country, there was nobody doing this. And we didn't, it didn't even occur to us that we would be doing it. And yet it's become uh, one of our biggest programs. Um, and we incorporate Learn to Ride in everything we do, especially our youth programs where in summer camp, after school, school day field trips, programs at schools, there's always going to be some kids who don't know how to write a bike. So it's a big part of what we do. And so the method is that we teach people how to balance the bike first. And then we add in the pedaling, which is different from how a lot of us adults who already know how to ride, how we were taught. A lot of us were taught by parents or siblings and we were kind of held up, you know, we're sitting on the seat, somebody's holding on to us or holding on the bike, pushing us along, and then they let go. For the person who's doing the teaching, well, let me back them. So, you know, and that's just fine as a way to teach people uh, if somebody wants to do it that way. But for a lot of people, that's hard work, especially if you're teaching a really little kid or somebody who's uh, an adult and they're kind of heavy and you're running along the bike uh, with the bike and holding them up. And for the person who's trying to learn, it's kind of terrifying that moment of terror when the person helping you lets go. So our method is very, very safe. And I won't say it doesn't involve risks, and I will get into that, but um, it's pretty darn safe. And really, the person who's learning teaches themselves how to write a bike. We always think that cycling is about independence and self-empowerment. And what better way to introduce yourself to bicycling than to teach yourself how to ride a bike, even if you're attending a bike in your in-person class. So our, whoops, our presentation this evening, we're gonna cover stuff that you need. We'll talk about how to set up the bike. We'll talk briefly about wearing a bike helmet and but the bulk of the presentation is going to be the process and method of teaching and learning how to ride a bike using our curriculum. Uh, but first here is I'm going to switch my screen share our 15 minutes of fame uh, where we got to teach a Sesame Street character Murray the Monster how to ride a bike for the first time. See if I can find Murray. Whoops, that's not it. Sorry. Hmm. I'm having problems finding Murray here. Let me see what happened. I may just have to move on. I have this queued up in my web browser because this doesn't play so well through Zoom. Let's try this. My screen share is not really showing it. Here we go. Well, it is slow to load up. So I'm going to skip the video, but we will send those videos out to you uh, with a follow up email that you'll get within the next few days. And um, the videos aren't really instructional videos, but they do kind of illustrate the, the method that we use for Learn to Ride. So sorry about the technical glitch here. I did have this queued up, but my screen share is not letting me see it. So let's move on and talk about what you're gonna need if you want to do this on your own or teach a kid. So of course you're gonna need a bike. And if you are a parent with a child, chances are you already have a bike for your kid. Uh, if you are teaching yourself, uh, that might be more challenging. 
Now we have had students who attended these online classes who went out and bought bikes to kind of like um, give them an incentive. Hey, I spent all this money on a bike. I better learn how to use it. So um, if you're teaching yourself or you're teaching a kid, I, I would suggest keep the bike very, very simple. Like a, a little kid's bike doesn't need hand brakes. It doesn't need a gear system. Uh, it doesn't need dual suspension. A kid doesn't really need that. They'll have a lot of fun on a bike. That's just a very simple single speed with a coaster brake. Um, and a lot of kids can't even use that, those extra bells and whistles anyway. If you're teaching yourself and you're an adult, again, we would suggest keeping the bike somewhat simple, um, easy to handle. So a basic mountain bike, a basic what's called a hybrid, which is sort of like a mountain bike, but with larger diameter wheels. Uh, most adult bikes are going to have a, a gear system and are going to have handbrakes, and that's fine. Uh, we would not recommend um, road racing bikes with the drop swoop handlebars. Uh, those bikes are for more advanced cyclists. Uh, you can use a beach cruiser bike. Um, folding bikes would work pretty well. Uh, you can try bike rentals. Uh, a lot of places are not renting bikes, but I know there's a big rental company in Hell's Kitchen near Columbus Circle, I think on 58th Street, called um, bike, Bikes Unlimited, it is. Uh, you can borrow a bike from a friend, uh, as long as it's not a road racing bike. I would also avoid things like dual suspension mountain bikes, which can be kind of heavy. Um, keep it simple. The key thing about the bike that you choose though is that when you are sitting on the seat and the seat is put all the way down, we'll talk about how to do that. You need to be able to rest your feet flat on the ground like this kid is doing. If you, the seat is all the way down and you are tippy toe, that bike is too big for you to learn on. It's not going to feel good physically, it's gonna seem scary. Can you prevent yourself from falling over? Uh, those are gonna be concerns. So feet flat on the ground will make this learning process a lot easier. You are going to need a helmet, especially if you are teaching a child uh, under the age of 13, 13 and under in New York City. Um, and we strongly recommend wearing a helmet uh, if you are older than 13. Uh, we'll get more into helmets later, but please do bring bike helmet to your first learning opportunity. We do do some work to set up the bike for easy and effective learning. And so there might be some common hand tools as well as one less than common tool and a bike pump involved in doing that. So you might need a bike pump, if you will definitely need or probably need a uh, what we call an adjustable wrench. And it looks like this and has a little dial here that adjusts the jaws of the wrench. We would recommend not getting a wrench that's longer than eight inches in the handle. And that's usually stamped right here. If you already have a wrench set like this one, that wrench set ne needs to be metric. Um, English imperial measurements that have fractions do not work with most bicycle parts. Depending on your bike, you might need a metric hex key or what's called an Allen wrench set. Some of them come in folding tools like this, and others, the wrenches are separate pieces. You might need, depending on the bike that you're using, a Phillips or straight screwdriver. And then depending on your pedals and your crank on the bike that you're using, you might need a pedal wrench. And that's gonna be the most obscure tool. You just can't walk into Target, Walmart, Sears, and buy a pedal wrench. That's not happening. Uh, you can get pedal wrenches from bike shops, 
You can get them online from Amazon or online retailers like REI and other online bike shops. You may not need that though, it just depends. And you're gonna need some space. So uh, I don't know if you all know New York City, but Northern Boulevard is not a place to go out and learn how to ride a bike. Um, if you look on our website, we use parks department spaces uh, in our community bike education centers that have large, flat, multi-purpose play areas like this. A lot of New York City schools uh, will have play areas like this that might be open on weekends. Uh, you might be able to find parking lots in New York City that have spaces like this unused on weekends. Or if you are not from New York City, um, some parking lots uh, do have space on weekends or during business hours that are closed. Even a very large, heavily used parking lot might have some large empty sections to it that are uh, kind of spacious during slower business times. Uh, we use in some of the parks, like St. Mary's Park in the Bronx and Flushing Meadows, Corona Park in, in Queens, park paths where there's more than one path running parallel to each other so that people who are walking and riding bikes can use one path and we can run our classes on a different path that's right adjacent. But mostly we try to use these multi-purpose areas like this. Um, so the needs are, you know, what you need are, is relatively simple for this. So let's talk about setting up the bike. Um, if you are using a bike that uh, has been sitting around your house, you're probably going to need to pump up the tires using a bike pump. Uh, if you don't have a pump, these are commonly available from Target, Walmart, Sears, bike shops sell them, Harbor Freight sells bike pumps. Uh, and I know there's one in the Bronx and one in Brooklyn. Otherwise, you can get them from online retailers. If you don't want to really spend money for a pump, a lot of times bike shops leave a pump or an air hose outside the door uh, during business hours, just so people can inflate their tires. Um, you can also use gas station air hoses. I think you throw a dollar's worth of quarters into a gas station air machine. Um, and there's a hose there. Just be careful with that because those uh, air compressors let out a lot of air. Um, so a little bit of air at one time with those. Or if you know somebody who is a bicyclist who has their own pump, you can certainly ask them, ask to borrow theirs. Uh, the tire pressure is printed somewhere on the side of the tires and it will say something like, PSI, inflate to maximum pressure, things like that. You are probably going to need to um, put the seat down. Let me back up with just one, one reason. The reason why we inflate the tires is that when tires are kind of like soft and underinflated and spongy, it's very hard work. It's a lot harder work to learn how to ride a bike on a tires that are pretty soft. So you want them to, when you squeeze them, they should be very firm, almost like rock hard. Uh, we put the seat down so that the new learner can rest their feet flat on the ground. That gives a feeling of security. And during the learning how to balance phase, they can effectively scoop themselves along the ground if their feet are flat on the ground. So you, We'll need to raise or lower the seat at this collar right here on the frame of the bike where the seat post goes in. On less expensive bikes and a lot of kids' bikes, that will either be using your adjustable wrench or a, I think it's a 14 millimeter mechanics wrench. Some bikes uh, might use an Allen wrench. Uh, at this, this call right here, and yet other bikes will use what's called a quick release lever where you don't need a tool at all. It's just a lever that you open up, you adjust your seat, you close it here. Um, to loosen this bolt, 
for the seat post clamp, you turn clockwise, you just loosen it, you do not need to take it out or remove it. That's a great way to lose parts. So we generally avoid removing stuff if we can. Put the seat down, make sure that the nose of the seat is pointed in the same direction as the frame, and then tighten this clamp again. You wanna make sure that the seat is level, and with a lot of less expensive bikes and kids' bikes, that is going to be, uh, again, I believe that's 14 millimeters. Right here, there's two bolts on each, or a bolt on each side. You just loosen them, make sure the seat is level, and then tighten them. Loosening, by the way, is almost always counterclockwise. Tightening is almost always clockwise. On uh, a little more expensive bikes or adult bikes, instead of these two bolts on, on each side, you'll have one Allen bolt using this wrench here that's underneath. And you have to loosen that, straighten out your saddle, um, and then retighten it. If the bike was assembled correctly in the first place, you won't need to mess with leveling the saddle. But it is painful and difficult to try to ride a bike with a saddle that's pointed, especially nose up. Um, and sometimes it's not really easy to have a saddle that's pointed nose down because you're constantly sliding off the saddle. If you are teaching a child and that kid's bike has uh, training wheels, you'll need to remove the training wheels. Now, when I bought my daughter her first bike, it had training wheels, and with the seat all the way down, she could not rest her feet flat on them. But that's okay. So you just leave the training wheels on and let your child pedal their bike around that way. That way they at least learn how to pedal the bike and use their leg muscles. The training wheels don't really teach you how to balance a bike, though. So don't think that they're going to learn anything about balancing from that but they will learn how to pedal the bike and they'll have them. If the bike does fit the kid, you wanna take those training wheels off and that involves either a 15 millimeter wrench or one of these adjustables. You want a 50 adjustable wrench so that the jaws fit on the flat sides of these hex nuts here. And this is a case where you do have to loosen counterclockwise and then completely remove that hex nut which holds this bracket on. You gotta remove the bracket and then put that hex nut back on and then tighten it using your wrench. And then do the other side. What you don't wanna do is get both of these hex nuts loose and or off at the same time because the wheel might shift its position in the frame the chain might get droopy, the tires might be rubbing on the frame. So one side at a time, loosen and remove one training wheel, reinstall that nut. So oftentimes that's the nut that holds the wheel on and then do the other side. These are pretty easy tasks. A hard task though might be removing the pedals. On a kid's bike or a beach cruiser, removing the pedals is generally easier. With adult bikes where you can pedal backwards um, and the crank and the pedal doesn't stop, um, removing the pedals might be more challenging because the crank wants to spin around backwards on you as you're trying to remove those pedals. The reason why we take the pedals off is they stick out, they're in the way, People run their shins, their ankles, their calves into the pedals. They're also kind of in the way mentally. If you don't know how to ride a bike for the first time, people are constantly trying to pedal the bike before they even know how to balance and control the steering. So we just get them out of the way so people aren't even thinking about pedaling. Um, okay, so if you have, do have a kid's bike, it's easier because when you pedal backwards, the pedal stops, which activates the brakes, and we'll get into that later. But it means that you can actually turn the wrench on the pedal and the cranks won't be spinning around on you. 
we find that the easiest way to remove the pedals is to point your crank arm towards the front of the bike, put the wrench on so it is pointing towards the back of the bike. Mm -hmm. And then we push down with our upper body weight on both the pedal and the wrench. Pushing down on the pedal prevents it from spinning around backwards on it, while pushing down on the wrench breaks the pedal free from the crank. An easy way to remember this, so the right side, which is always the chain side, uh, you're going to turn counterclockwise like with everything else. Or just spin the top of the pedal spindle towards the back of the bike. Same with the left side, crank arm forward, pedal wrench kind of pointing backwards. Put your weight down on both the pedal and the wrench and it will break that pedal free from the crank. And then you have to unscrew it or unthread it with your fingers or the wrench. Um, the left pedal is reverse threaded. So you'll notice my arrow here is going actually going clockwise to loosen and remove that pedal. So just a better close up view of the pedal because people don't kind of understand how you remove them and how they're attached to the body. The main body of the pedal is where you put your foot or your shoe. And people try to spin this around and think that they're going to loosen the pedal. And it doesn't because the pedal is actually attached to the rest of the bike, to the crank, by the spindle, which is the silver part on this pedal. The spindle goes clear inside here, so this part's invisible. And when it's attached to the bike, these threads right here are also invisible. You can't see them. They're inside the crank. So you're going to put your wrench here, and you have to fit the jaws of the wrench on the flat sides of the pedal spindle. Some pedal will have six flat sides, which makes it easy. Others only have two flat sides and then kind of like two rounded sides. So you don't want to make sure that your wrench is tight on these flat sides. Now I've seen people struggle with this, like figuring out how to attach the wrench to the pedal. Um, the other thing you might notice is there's not a lot of space between the threads and the pedal body here. Your mechanics wrench or your eight inch adjustable wrench will probably fit in there. But if that space is too narrow, this part right here, you're going to need a pedal wrench. So if you are just like all thumbs and completely clueless mechanically about this stuff, bike shop, another more experienced cyclist, a bike mechanic can help you with these. Bike shop's going to charge you some money. Uh, if you are trying to use a city bike, don't even try to remove the pedals. Uh, you can't use the methods that we just showed you to remove pedals from the city bikes because they have special proprietary pedals on them. If you are using a rental bike, ask the rental company or the shop to just take the pedals off for you. Okay, let's briefly talk about wearing a bike helmet. Um, again, this method is pretty safe, this method of learning or teaching somebody how to ride a bike. But it is possible to have a spill, and we don't want you to uh, hit your head on something hard and get a head injury. So please, please, please wear a bike helmet. Not a football helmet, not a hockey helmet, not a baseball helmet, not a car racing helmet, not a welding helmet, a bike helmet. You can get bike helmets from bike shops. You can get them from Amazon, REI, or other online bike retailers. You can call 311 and get a bike helmet for free. They'll tell you how to get a bike helmet for free. But please wear a bike helmet. Biking is a great and good thing. It's good for you. It's good for me. Until somebody gets a head injury, then that's not so good. 
please make sure that you are wearing the bike helmet correctly. And we do have a video on that, uh, which will be shared with you. Um, the helmet should be worn. Uh, th there is a front and a back to the helmet. The back usually has a plastic piece with a dial on it on most modern helmets. The front will probably have a logo or maybe a visor. The helmet should be covering your forehead and it should be resting down on your head. The edge of the helmet should not be resting on the, like around the crown of your head. If it's resting around the crown of your head, your, your helmet's too small. Um, if the helmet is not covering the forehead when you have it buckled, you need to adjust the sets of straps that come down on both sides of your head. And typically when the helmet's exposing your forehead, that means this strap is too tight, this one is too loose, and you need to use this side buckle, loosen it up and readjust the relationship between those two straps. So that this strap is pulling that helmet down over your forehead. When you are done adjusting, if you do need to adjust that, the strap should form a nice neat V around your ears, and that side buckle should be up right below your earlobes on both sides. Then you have a chin buckle, which is right here. It's a pinch buckle, so one side fits into the other, clicks into place. And when it is buckled, the helmet, the, the strap should, um, it shouldn't be like choking or binding or super tight, but it should be tight enough that if you do have a spill, the helmet stays on your head. Uh, we use a two finger rule where you can fit two fingers between the strap and your chin or your jaw when the helmet is buckled. This is my daughter, by the way, when she was like in sixth grade, she just graduated from college. Um, when the helmet is adjusted correctly, you should be able to look up and just see the bottom edge of the helmet. It should be sitting straight, level on your head. It shouldn't be like tilted. Uh, you know, it should feel like you're wearing a hat. Okay, we have got our bike adjusted and set up. We've got our helmet strapped on. We are ready to learn and or teach somebody how to ride a bike. So um, I've taught a lot of our classes. I've taught a lot of our kids' classes. And if you are teaching a kid and you are a parent or a guardian, uh, we have some rules. And I think if you're teaching yourself, you should apply these rules to yourself as well. Um, so the first thing is this is, this is riding a bike. Riding a bike is mostly fun. So keep it fun. This is not the baton death march. Keep it fun. Uh, that means be positive and be patient. If you are teaching yourself and you're an adult, congratulations. You are like trying something new. And for a lot of adults, that's really hard. Um, if you are teaching a kid, you know, I, I see a lot of parents out there uh, on their own in the parks and they purchase what are called uh, scoop bikes or strider bikes. They're bikes that come without cranks and pedals and chains. And they're just taking a walk in the park and the kid is with them scooting along on this, this little bike. And that's what we're doing with a bike that when we remove the pedals, it's the same thing. You just sit on the bike and you scoot along. And so if you're teaching a child, you can take your kid along just to do anything, bring their bike with them and let them just practice rolling along. It doesn't need to be a special like, oh, we're going to learn how to ride a bike now. Uh, whether you're teaching yourself or somebody else, we're gonna have some teaching points on the next several pages. What to say, what to do, how to practice. So don't criticize your student or yourself. Be a coach, remind yourself, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This can be hard work, so take breaks. 
get some water. It's always a good idea to bring some snacks. Um, and then we limit our classes to two hours. If you have not picked this up in two hours, give it a break and come back another day and try it again some other time. Uh, most people, they don't, most people do get it. We studied this, get it within a two hour period at our classes. But some people don't and they come back or they practice on their own and they eventually do pick. So another thing I'm going to emphasize, if you are teaching somebody else, uh, you can say these things that are on the slide deck. You know, there are words coming out of your mouth. But it's always more effective as a teaching technique to get on a bike and demonstrate what you want your student to do. Now, if you're teaching yourself, this is going to be tough. And this is why we've tried to include some pictures and some video. And hopefully we'll be able to make a video uh, that's more instructional than what we have now. Anyway, get on your seat of your bike and sit on that seat. You're not supporting your weight with your legs. The seat is supporting your weight, the seat of the bicycle. You're sitting on the seat. Your eyes are looking ahead, forward, not down in front of your front wheel. That's what everybody wants to do. They're gazing down three feet in front of their front. Don't do that. Look ahead. The looking ahead actually helps you with balance. Then we recommend starting out with both your feet ahead of you towards the front wheel. And you push back with your feet, propelling the bike forward, and you keep doing that propelling yourself forward, and you want to pick up some speed and momentum. The speed and momentum helps because the wheels give the bike, they have a gyroscopic effect, but not if the wheels are barely moving. They have a gyroscopic effect if they're moving a little bit faster and have more momentum and speed. And the gyroscopic effect, if you know anything about gyroscopes, helps something maintain its balance, equilibrium, its center of gravity. So you scoot yourself along two feet in front, push back, two feet in front, push back, and you want to pick up some speed and momentum. And when you have a little bit of momentum, try lifting your feet off the ground and rolling the bike forward without touching your feet back on the ground. Now there's a couple little risks here. If you don't take these risks, you're not going to learn how to ride a bike. One is getting some speed and momentum. Some people are just really afraid of that. Now we're not talking Tour de France, bike race, downhill type levels of speed. We're talking faster than a slow walking speed. Um, if you, your practice space has a little bit of slope to it, that can help you pick up some speed and momentum. We do not recommend, though, using a steep downhill to try to learn how to ride a bike. That's a little too much speed. The other um, risk, the little risk that you have to take is to lift your feet off the ground. Uh, those feet are kind of like your training wheels. They prevent you from falling over. But if you don't lift them off the ground while the bike is rolling, and take that little risk, you're not going to learn how to balance the bike if your feet are constantly uh, touching the ground. Now, if you're rolling along and you start to lean off to one side or the other, it's fine to put a one or both feet down to prevent a fall or a tip over. We are not encouraging people to take risks to the point where they injure themselves or fall over and get a scrape or a cut. Please don't do that. So this is kind of a still picture of what it looks like. Um, this is from class several years ago. You can see she's resting her weight on the seat. She's scooted the bike along and picked up some momentum. And you can tell she's got some momentum because look at her streamers. And you can kind of look the leaves in the background, the motion of the wheels was a little bit blurry from the camera. 
uh, which means she's got a little, you know, she's got good momentum going here. And then she's lifted her feet off the ground. And she's just gliding. The only thing I'd like to see her doing is looking ahead. She does look like she's kind of looking down in front of her front wheel. Look ahead, that helps you with balance. Uh, we'll also share this video with you. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm having video problems tonight, uh, but you will get those videos in a follow-up email. A couple of other teaching techniques and teaching points. Uh, if your bike has handbrakes, like an adult bike, use the right brake. Uh, to slow yourself down or stop or stop if you need to stop. Uh, leave for the time being, leave the left brake alone. We'll come back to the other brake later on. Second thing we learned uh, from another organization actually is a little technique they teach, and that is if you start to lean off to one side, you're losing your center of gravity. Steer towards that side. That means if you're leaning right, steer a little bit to the right. You don't need to make it a hard steer, but just a little steer to the right, and that will actually recenter the bike. If you steer the opposite direction from your lean, you're gonna go instantly out of control. The bike will just uh, tip over in the direction that you were leaning. Uh, the second thing that we have our students practice if they are struggling to figure out the balancing thing is, you want to keep the bike moving. Uh, I already mentioned the importance of momentum, and a lot of people just every time they feel like they're going to tip over, they come to a dead stop. And that's fine as far as preventing tip overs, but it becomes hard work after a while to keep constantly restart that bike and get yourself back up to some, some momentum and speed. So what we tell people is if you are starting to like tilt over to one side, put your foot down on that side and kick yourself back up to center. If you start leaning off to the other side, kick your foot off to that side and lean back up to center. That way you can start to figure out your center of gravity while the bike is still moving and you don't wear yourself out, tire yourself out by stopping and starting constantly. It is a lot of work to restart the bike to get it moving again. Uh, I should mention, by the way, uh, if your practice space does have a slope to it, it's okay once you get to the bottom of that slope to get off that bike and just walk it back to the top of the slope because it's kind of hard to push yourself along uh, up that slope. So it, it's okay to do that uh, if you're feeling like you're not getting any momentum on the uphill side of your slope. So how do you know when you're ready to start introducing the pedal? Uh, what we look for at our classes and the way we train our instructors is that you don't put the pedals back on and introduce pedaling until somebody is really mastered balancing and controlling the bike. So uh, it's kind of funny at our kids' classes, kids are like really impatient. They're like, I want my pedals back on, mister. And, um, I, you know, I always tell them, no, show me what you can do. Show me what I was having you practice and show me how you're doing. And then they'll try and show me and then somebody comes up and interrupts me while I'm watching them and then I miss what they're doing. So, um, but you can tell they either have control of the bike or they don't. If they get some momentum going and they push off and they lift their feet off the ground and the bike is rolling in a straight line without swerving, without wobbling, without constantly stopping and putting foot down to maintain balance, then they have control over the bike. Now, eventually the bike's gonna slow down. When it does, it's gonna like wanna tip over and that's fine. If they are swerving, wobbling, constantly stopping, putting feet or foot down, to maintain their center of gravity, they're not ready for pedaling. This is just going to make uh, things harder work and, and more frustrating. So, 
so here's another kind of like still shot from one of our classes. Uh, this is in McCarran Park, Brooklyn. And um, this woman in, in the front of the picture, she doesn't have pedals on her bike. It looks like she's rolling along and maybe tilting off to her right side and she's put a foot down. And what we want her to do is kick herself back up to center while the bike is moving. And you can sort of see that's what this guy is doing here, the second guy in the line. He uh, has one foot off the ground and the other foot he's, he's pushed put down and maybe he's like pushing himself back up the center while the bike is still moving. Uh, I like that both of them, it looks like all three of these cyclists, all four that we can see clearly are all looking ahead and not down. Okay, let's talk about adding pedaling into this process. So the first thing is to put those pedals back on the bike. And um, if you remember from our pedal anatomy slide, you're going to screw the pedals into the cranks using the spindles. A lot of people try to spin the body of the pedal, and that doesn't really work. Um, the spindles are fine threaded. They're kind of like a little bit tricky to get threaded in straight. Uh, so you want to use your fingers on the spindles, not a wrench, not the body of the pedal to get them started. Now, the tricky part here is remembering that the right side is just like everything else. You turn clockwise to screw it in and tighten it. The left side, however, is reverse threaded, so you have to turn counterclockwise to screw it in and get it started. An easy way to remember this is when you're putting the pedal into the crank, you turn the spindle toward the top of the spindle towards the front wheel on both sides. So one question, and this is an important safety question, and that is how do you tell the left and the right pedal? They actually look identical, but they're not. Um, the threads are reversed on one of the pedals, but even that's hard to tell from just looking at them. So you want to look at the end of the spindle right here. And um, probably there will be an L or an R stamped on the end of the spindle, which of course stands for left or right. Or you might have uh, maybe on the uh, sides of the spindle where you put the wrench, it will have an L and an R stamped into it. Or maybe it'll have a sticker stuck somewhere on the body of the pedal, but stickers come off. Another way to tell, and people don't really notice this, it's a little detail, but on less expensive pedals, the right spindle where you would put the wrench is smooth. And I don't have a great picture of it, I probably need a better picture, but the left spindle will have a series of little grooves on it. Um, and that, that's the left side pedal. So you use your fingers to thread it in. Now, if you get the pedal threaded in maybe three quarters of a turn, almost one turn and it stops, please don't put a wrench on it and force it because probably what's happened is you have the pedal uh, cross threaded in the crank. So you back it out, straighten it out, try it again. Sometimes the crank or the pedal will have burrs. I usually put a little oil or grease on the pedal threads so that they thread in more smoothly. If you get it like two or three turns and you run into some kind of a spot where there's some rust or dirt or a burr, then it's okay to use your wrench. Uh, and then finally, you want to use your wrench for final tightening. Um, you don't use to, need to use monster size strength, just a little bit of arm strength to snug that pedal into the crank. But please make sure that you do tighten them. Please make sure you get right on right and left on left, because if you get that wrong, the pedals will strip out the threads in the crank. The pedals will look like they're installed correctly, 
but eventually one of them or both of them will come out when somebody puts a lot of force or weight on the pedal, say when they stand up to climb or pedal hard. And that can cause a crash and an injury, having a pedal come out while you're standing on it. So um, our instructor, Irisema, uh, who's in this picture, practices something. And this is the only time in our method that we hold on to the bike for somebody. Uh, before she has them start out again, she holds on to the handlebar. The student is sitting on the seat, resting their weight on the seat. And she has the student look at her, look at her face. And she says, find the pedals without looking down, because you're going to need to do this while the bike is moving. And I picked up this technique, and I think it helps a lot. We also keep the pedals um, level. Uh, if you imagine the rotation of the pedal as a clock, we keep the pedals at 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock to start out. So it's find the pedals. Now, if you're teaching yourself, you might lean up with one arm or one shoulder against the wall, or another arm holding the handlebars, looking ahead, sitting on the seat, and then you find the pedals without looking down. So how do we get people to start pedaling the bike? So we try to keep the teaching technique simple. Uh, have them do what they were doing before. Uh, I do get on a bike and demonstrate what I want them to do so they can get a visual image of the process. But it's essentially what they were doing before. Sit on the seat, look ahead, start out with both feet ahead of, the, uh, ahead of you towards the front wheel, push back, push back, get some momentum, when you have some momentum and the bike is rolling along, lift your feet off the ground. But now, instead of just rolling along, you're going to put your feet on those pedals. And most people will just start pedaling forward on their own. Other people will just rest their feet on the pedals and glide along that way. And that's okay. But we do want people to start pedaling because that's what keeps the bike uh, having some momentum is the pedal. Now, there's probably going to be a couple of, of issues and problems that crop up here. One is we have the seat too low for pedaling. It's low enough to feel comfortable that you're not going to fall over while you're learning how to balance. It's low enough so you can get your propulsion by pushing your feet on the ground. But it's really too low for pedaling. And then what happens is when the pedal comes to the top of the pedal stroke, uh, they can't get their leg, their thigh, their knee through the top of the pedal stroke. They shift their weight on the seat to try to do that and they lose their balance. So I look for that, I'm watching that, and if I see it, and I almost always do, we raise the seat one to two inches. That won't be a huge amount. The seat's still too low, really, for what we would regard as normal pedal, but it will be easier for um, starting out with the pedal. The student might be tippy toe on uh, the seat at this point a little bit, but not so tippy toe that it seems scary. And they'll still be able to get some propulsion by putting, pushing off with their feet on the ground. Um, do remind students when you're starting out, by the way, that the pedals are on the bike, they're sticking out. You don't want to run your ankles in the pedals or your shins or your calves. So um, you might have to put your feet further out from the bike than you were before while you're pushing it along. A second thing that happens, a second point here, is kids bikes or cruiser bikes that have what are called coaster brakes. A coaster brake is on a single speed bike when you pedal backwards, it activates a brake in the rear wheel. So uh, if we have the pedals at three o'clock and nine o'clock, if that first foot goes on the pedal that's pointed towards the back wheel and puts weight on that pedal, it's gonna pedal backwards and activate the brake and then they lose their momentum. So we watch for that too. And if we see that, we're like, hey, you know, your first foot 
has to go on the pedal that's pointing forward. And that will help maintain momentum of the bike without activating the brake. By the way, if you are teaching with a bike or learning with a bike that has coaster brakes, make sure that the crank is kind of like not activated. Like it'll, it can rest in that braking position and you're actually slowing yourself down and making your momentum harder to get. So make sure that you pedal forward just a tad to release the brake. Uh, I don't have it listed here, but there's a third thing that I have noticed among some of our students, and that is the pedaling itself. Like, they'll be pedaling, the cranks are rotating around, but the bike is losing momentum. And what I learned is that some people have never pedaled anything in their lives. They've never pedaled a bike with the training wheels. They've never pedaled uh, a little pedal car or a pedal boat never pedal a tricycle and they watch those of us who are riding bikes and we make it look so easy and effortless but it's not our legs our muscles are actually the engine for the bike and you do have to put in some muscle and some effort to keep the bike moving so if it looks like this person's pedaling but they're losing momentum they're not really um picking up or gain, maintaining their momentum, they need to pedal harder. Now, if you have a multi-speed bike, the problem might be that they're not in an, an appropriate gear for their bike to help them maintain momentum easily. Um, I don't have a diagram, I need to change the presentation here and add a diagram, but if the chain is all the way over the left on the crank set, it's on the all the way over to the left on the rear wheel, that's actually a really hard gear to pedal in. And somebody's gonna have to use a huge amount of muscle force to gain and maintain momentum. And using that much force, they're, they're gonna lose their balance. The opposite side of the coin is the chain move. If you have the chain all the way over to the right on the crank set and on the rear wheel, typically on a lot of bikes, that's gonna be such an easy gear but they'll be spinning, spinning, spinning and not doing anything because that gear is for going up steep hills. So uh, really we want to use a middle kind of gear. Put the chain in the middle gear on the back wheel. On the crank, if you have three gears on the crank, put the chain, use the shifter to put the chain on the middle gear there. If it only has two gears, put the chain over to the left on the smaller gear on the crank. That'll be an easier gear. So what you want is enough gear that they, their pedaling effort gives the bike some momentum, but it's not too easy and it's not too massively hard. Kind of a middle of the range type of gear. So there might be some, pay, some learning curve here. Um, your body's moving, it's having to exert some pressure, some force on the pedals, and it might look like you're back to square one. Oh, gee, they're losing their balance. Uh, just remind them, it's kind of the techniques, look ahead, make the bike go fast first, lift your feet off the ground, rest your feet on the pedals and start pedaling. Um, an important point here is the bike does have to be moving first before you try to start pedaling. I have seen some people try to, you know, the bike is dead stopped and they lift their feet off the ground and try to pedal from a dead stop. Nobody starts a bike, not even me. Uh, the bike has to be moving first, then pedal. Okay, so uh, a lot of a lot of time you're going to get this pretty quickly if you've already mastered how to balance and control the bike. Um, and now you're riding around in your pedal. We have had some people get really excited about this and they start picking up speed and zipping around and making sharp turns, which might be a lot of fun. But really, you want to teach somebody how to stop the bike safely right away when, when they start pedaling. Once they're riding around, teach them or teach yourself how to stop the bike. So if you're teaching somebody else, this is another point where we get on a bike and demonstrate. Uh, 
Um, and we do have a video that covers using the brakes and stopping the bike safely. But what I teach our students and what I demonstrate, I get on a bike and demonstrate it, is first, we have three rules here. First, use all the brakes that your bike has, or if it's just got two hand brakes, use both hand brakes. If it's just got one coaster brake, then that's what you use. If it's got one hand brake and one coaster brake, use both of them. Now with the brakes, especially hand brakes, the brakes are not an on and off switch. It's not all or nothing. You can squeeze them a little bit and then squeeze them gradually harder. What we don't want people doing is getting up a lot of speed and then slamming on the brakes because typically that causes kind of a crash or a fall over. So learn how to modulate the brakes using your hands, or if it's a coaster brake, you don't want to jam on the brakes and then skid the rear wheel. The skidding is actually a loss of braking power. You want your, your brakes to really be like a car's anti-lock brakes where they don't skid. Second rule is keep your weight on the seat. Don't try to bail out while you're using the brakes. This is not an airplane. Okay, um, people do that, especially in panic situations. The way the brakes work, especially hand brakes, uh, is that 60% of your braking power is in the front brake, even though the brakes themselves are identical. The brake levers are identical. And the reason that is, is physics, okay? Your brakes are slowing the bike down. They're slowing the bike's wheels down pretty quickly. They're just not slowing you down quite as fast. And so your weight is being forced forward as the bike slows down. That's why you want to keep your weight on the seat and resist that forward momentum. Uh, it also makes your back brake more effective if you keep your weight back there on that seat. Uh, what happens if people stand up while they're using their hand brakes is the front wheel of the back wheel can actually come off the ground and the front wheel kind of acts like a pivot it will lock up and the next thing you know is that you are indeed bailing out and you're flying over the handlebars and that causes that can cause you know facial neck or collarbone injuries keep your weight on the seat please Third rule is, and this is sometimes a habit, we have to have our students break because they've been using their feet to stop when they didn't have any pedals on the bike. So break that habit. We are not doing Fred Flintstone stops here. None of us are named Fred Flintstone. This is not a cartoon. If you are using the brakes, you keep your feet on the pedals until the bike is 99% stopped. As it rolls to a stop, the bike is going to lean to one side. You can even control which side it leans to. And you put your foot down on the ground on that side to support your weight. Typically, you're going to slide off the saddle as that bike is 99.5% stopped. Okay? The only time you come off the saddle is just as the bike is really stopped. Um, we don't, so I see people using their feet on the ground to stop the bike. And if that's a habit people develop in a real panic emergency situation, one, their feet, you can get a foot injury or an ankle injury doing that. And two, you're not going to stop your bike at speed using your feet on the ground. The best way, the most effective way to stop your bike is using the brakes. That's the fastest way to stop a bike. Okay, final point, and that is turning. Uh, some people pick this up pretty quickly. Other people struggle with it a little bit. Uh, you are riding a vehicle that has two wheels that are in a line with each other. And when you turn, the bike wants to lean with the turn, and it should. That is natural, that's physics. Uh, you don't have to do anything special with your own like weight necessarily. 
but you shouldn't fight that lean. You shouldn't fight that lean because uh, your bike will actually be harder to control, harder to handle as you do turn the bike wants to lean over a little bit. So if turning a little motion with the handlebar goes a long ways, a little bit of leaning also goes a long ways. You don't need to turn sharply. You don't need to lean dramatically. Keep it fluid, keep it light, a little goes a long ways. If you do get to the point where you are turning sharply and leaning over quite a bit more, uh, please do practice this inside pedal up habit. Uh, you should even do that if you're not turning or leaning sharply. The reason why we want the, in, the pedal up on the inside of the turn, let's say I'm turning left. I want my left pedal up because as I lean, if that left pedal is down, it is now getting very, very close to the ground. And if you lean a lot, that left pedal is gonna strike the ground and possibly cause a loss of control as you jack your back wheel off the ground. Um, so please, inside pedal up. Usually I coast or I glide through a turn. I'm not pedaling through a turn, especially a sharp turn. I, I coast and glide through turns. So that is, uh, that is exactly what we teach in our learn to ride class. We do also add sometimes what we call the power start, but that is something we teach as, as a standard practice for our bicycle and basics class, which we don't really add. Uh, we don't have that online version of that. It doesn't translate well online. I'm not sure this translates well online, but we have had some students who uh, took this online class and then used the recording, used the slide deck, and went out and taught themselves how to write a book. And so, you know, if you have gotten yourself or somebody else to that point where you're now writing long and pedaling, you can stop, I'm sorry, start and stop smoothly. You know, celebrate, be like Mr. Met and uh, have a little parade for yourself and congratulate yourself on uh, learning how to ride a bike. Um, especially if you teach yourself, that's, that's an amazing thing, I think. Um, and that is the end of our slide, day, slide deck. I am going to um, change our security settings so that people can Unmute themselves if you want to ask a question verbally. This is our question and answer time. I am going to look at chat and see uh, what our questions are. <laughs> All right, so we have one comment that sounds like riding a horse and um, I did that too. I grew up on a farm in Nebraska and we had a few horses. And um, as I recall, we didn't have saddles. And so I had um, I had to learn how to keep centered on the horse, especially if the horse was trotting or galloping without like falling over. Um, we have a helpful comment from Oscar. Quick check, gas stations have free air. Um, I don't even know if I've seen a quick check gas station, but I uh, don't drive, I don't have a car, so I don't go to gas stations that often. Um, if you are using gas station air, remember those um, compressors and air tanks have a high volume of air for inflating car tires, which need a lot more air than bike tires. So, um, do be careful, a little bit of air at a time in that valve. Um, we have a question from Amy. We get this question a lot. Would a city bike work despite the weight? So it might work. Um, if that's your best option, I would say go out and try it. It would probably help to, um, have a little bit of a, a downhill slope if you're using a city bike. Um, again, not a steep hill, please, with this technique. 
a little downhill slope doesn't hurt though. If you get to, the, you're not going to be able to remove the pedals on a city bike, please don't try them. So you're, you are gonna have to try this um, pedals on, which means pushing yourself along with your feet spread further apart on the ground. Uh, the other thing is you, if you do get to the point on a city bike where you are want to start pedaling, there's a gear shifter on the right, uh, on the right of the handlebar, and I would suggest putting that gear shifter in number one, uh, which will be, a, I think, a good starting gear for a city bike. Okay. We have a question from Maggie. I am teaching myself how to ride a bike. It looks like she's got a picture. Oh no, it's a regular bike. Uh, with my eyesight, it looks like a tandem bike with two people on it. I started today, my difficulty is starting. It takes me a few minutes to start. Uh, and, and she saw the city bike feels heavy. Um, we like basic mountain bikes and basic hybrids. Um, and we, we would recommend bike shop quality bikes if you're using those types of models. Uh, the Target, Walmart, big box bikes, they can be pretty heavy also and um, maybe not assembled correctly or tuned up correctly for using the brakes and maybe having to deal with the gears. Uh, but if that's all you've got uh, is a Murray or a Huffy uh, or a Kemp from a department store, you know, a big box store, then that's what you've got. Um, you know, Maggie, what, what I did say about starting, remember, wait on the seat, eyes forward, get a lot of momentum first. Make the bike move with your feet on the ground, then start pedaling. Um, if you've gotten to the point where you're trying to pedal. You really, I mean, I'm able to do it to pedal a bike from a stop position, but it's, it's really not, nobody does it that way. Even a standard power start, you're pushing off first and your pedaling follows. Let's see here. Uh, this is a good question. We get this question a lot. Um, is Dehan folding bike okay? Um, actually, I think a Dehan or most other folding bikes are um, are pretty good because uh, they have pretty low standover. They do ride pretty well. They have a lot of up and down seat adjustability. Uh, so they fit a, fit a variety of, of people uh, in terms of heights. So yeah, and you know they're they're made to you know at least try to feel like a normal everyday big wheel bike. Uh, so yeah, you can try learning how to ride a bike on a day on. I would just use the, the same techniques and practices we suggested here. So um, Oscar has a comment about looking down when the bike is moving to find the pedals. So this is where Oscar, you might need a friend to help you by just holding the bike in stationary position while you sit on the seat, you are holding on to the grips of the, the handlebar. And you are looking at your friend's face while you find the pedals. Um, if you don't have somebody who can help with that, um, you could try bracing yourself up against the wall, maybe leaning with your shoulder or with your, your arm against the wall and your other hand is holding the grip of the handlebar and just sit on the seat, try to maintain your balance and look at the, you know, have your feet find the pedals by feel, not looking down. The other thing is, you know, when you are rolling along, this is why having more momentum is better because more momentum helps A, keep the bike balanced, B, it helps move the bike along farther while you're trying to figure out where in the heck those pedals are at. Uh, but really try not to look down. This is also why we say keep the pedals in a three o'clock, nine o'clock position. And then have your first foot 
go on the pedal that's pointed forwards. Uh, because what happens is if, if your first foot goes on the pedal that's backwards, the pedal starts spinning around, you're not getting any momentum out of it. Um, and then people, everything goes haywire. Uh, the pedal might spin if you put your first foot on the pedal forward, but at least you're helping propel the bike when that happens. Uh, but it just, it, finding the pedals without looking down takes practice. I think keeping the pedals in a consistent position every time, three o'clock, nine o'clock can help. And um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I was going to add something else to that. Uh, no, so if you do, you know, club and you have to stop, and you know, you can always kick the pedal backwards towards the position that you want it in uh, while you're stopped, and then and then try it again. All right, so I think that got us through the questions in chat. Does anybody have any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask verbally if, if you want to go that way. Are they going to be having more physical, um, the bike 101 teaching? Yeah. Yes. So um, we've been slow to restart that. Part of that is staffing and budget, and part of it is uh, we are being very careful about having our programs and our bikes be transmitter of the coronavirus. Yeah. So right now, and I just posted classes this afternoon, there are Thursday classes at Shirley Chisholm State Park in South Brooklyn. Um, we will be, I haven't posted them yet, but we will be having some October classes in Riverside Park near 158th Street. Um, I am offering a few um, either private lessons, which are more expensive, or very, very small group classes, which are half the price of a private lesson. Uh, if you are interested in a paid, either private lesson or paid small group class, email me. You have my email address from the Zoom link today. And I will put you on the contact list for those. Um, the classes at Shirley Chisholm and the classes at Riverside are um, those will be free, but they they're not going to be large groups of people. So once I post them, they are going to sell out pretty quickly or fill up pretty quickly. Sells the common word for a free class. Yes. Um, so do keep an eye out for those. Okay. Um, uh, do you provide, they provide the bikes, right? The bikes are provided? Yeah. And both for the free and the paid classes and lessons. We provide the bikes at our bike education centers. And again, we have, um, because we took a huge hit on our budget this year on our fundraising, the locations available are, are really they're close to where staff are at, and I'm one of the staff. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we just can't spend, you know, six hours round trip running clear out to East New York or Flushing Meadows or something like that. Uh, we just don't have the staff time for it. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, but that um, definitely sounds interesting, particularly uh, I'm way north of City Bike Land, right? I'm up in Inwood, so. Uh, yeah, so in high on the west side is it, I'm saying high on the west side is good already. Yeah, um, I'm actually I live in Cambridge, Bronx, so Van Cortland, Inwood, and Northern Riverside are pretty close to me. Inwood, especially. Uh, well, I will look to send you an email. Thank you. Yeah, send me it's an really email. Really helpful. On the list, I, I'm actually going uh, taking two weeks off starting Friday, so I won't be giving any private lessons uh, for the next two weeks. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> but you know what? The, the fall, the autumn is just really nice in New York City, generally. Biking. The weather's cool. It's less humid. Uh, it's pretty seasonal. Uh, 
I, I think it's the best bike riding weather of uh, all of our seasons in New York. Okay, we have a little look at messages again. Any other questions? Okay, it is 7.25. We've actually finished a little ahead of time, uh, which is unlike me. I tend to be long-winded. Um, please do, if you are trying this on your own, that you can't do a private lesson or can't get to one of our free classes, let me know how it's going. Um, you know, we're interested. If you have a success story, putting that up on social media. Uh, I have heard from people who took this online class and taught themselves. I realize it's not easy. Uh, the mechanics stuff may not be easy. Getting access to a bike if you're an adult may not be easy. Um, so, but if, if you do learn on your own, drop me a line, let me know. I, I would really appreciate hearing that. Um, on that note, um, I did mention we will be uh, sending you a follow-up email with the videos that were linked in the presentation. And um, you'll be hearing from, I think her name is, our staff member Chantal is sending those out. Um, have a good night, everybody. And, uh, you know, have, have a good rest of your week. Thank you for joining our class. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.